चैप्टर फोर सेंसरी फिटनेस बीट्स ट्रूथ कोट लिटल डिड आई रियलाइज दैट इन अ फ्यू इयर्स आई वुड इनकाउंटर एन आइडिया डारविन्स आइडिया बियरिंग एन अनमिस्टेकेबल लाइकनेस टू यूनिवर्सल एसिड it eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized world view with most of the old landmarks still recognizable but transformed in fundamental ways by daniel dennett darwin's dangerous idea second quote if you ask me what my ambition would be it would be that everybody would understand what an extraordinary remarkable thing it is that they exist in a world which would otherwise just be plain physics The key to the process is self-replication. Richard Dawkins in John Brockman's Life. Most of us assume that we normally see reality as it is. If you see an apple, that's because there really is an apple. Many scientists assume that we have evolution to thank for this. Accurate perceptions enhance our fitness, so natural selection favors them, especially in species like Homo sapiens with bigger brains. Most neuroscientists and experts in perceptions agree. They sometimes say that our perceptions recover or reconstruct the shapes and colors of real objects. Many don't bother to mention it because it's just too obvious. <laughs> But are they right? Does natural selection favor true perceptions? Is it possible that we did not evolve to see truly that our perceptions of space, time and objects do not reveal reality as it is? That a peach does not exist when no one looks? Can the theory of evolution transform this stale philosophical chestnut into a crisp scientific claim? Some say no. The notion that a peach isn't there when no one looks is irremediably unscientific. After all, what observation could possibly tell us what happens when no one observes? None. It's a self-contradiction. This half-baked proposal can be tested by an experiment, so it's metaphysics, not science. This rejoinder misses a point of logic and a matter of fact. First, logic. If we can test the claim that a piece does not exist when no one looks, then we can test the opposite and widely held claim that it does exist. Both claims posit what happens when no one observes. If one is not science, then neither is the other. Nor is the claim that the sun exists when no one looks, that the Big Bang happened over 13 billion years ago, and other such claims routinely made in science. Now the matter of fact, observation can test a claim about what happens when no one looks. One can be pardoned for not realizing this. Even the brilliant physicist Wolfgang Pauli missed it and likened such claims to, under quotes, the ancient question of how many angels are able to sit on the point of a needle, closed quotes. But in 1964, the physicist John Bell proved him wrong. There are experiments that can test such claims. For instance, the claim that an electron has no spin when no one looks. Bell's experiments have been run in many variations with consistent results. Bell's theorem transported such claims from the realm of angels to the beat of science. We will discuss how in chapter 6. Thus, these claims are now in the purview of science. But are they in the purview of evolution? Can we ask precisely if natural selection favors true perceptions? Can we expect the theory of evolution to render a verdict? Some argue that it cannot. Perceptions that are true must also enhance the fitness. Truth and fitness, they claim, are not rival strategies, but rather the same strategy seen from different perspectives. Thus, evolution cannot render an impartial verdict. This argument fails because it forgets a simple point about fitness. According to standard accounts of evolution, although fitness payoffs depend on the true state of the world, they also depend on the organism, its state, its action, and its competition. feces for instance offer big payoffs for hungry flies but not for hungry humans a hydrothermal vent belching hydrogen sulfide at 80 degrees celsius into water a few kilometers deep offers big payoffs for the pompe worm alvinella pompejana but hideous death to all but a handful of extremophiles the distinction between a state of the world say a pile of feces and the fitness payoffs it offers to an organism say a fly or a man is essential in evolution according to standard accounts of evolution payoffs can vary widely while the true state of the world remains fixed it follows that seeing truth and seeing fitness are two distinct strategies of perception not one strategy seen in different lights the two strategies can compete one may dominate and the other go extinct so it is a central question not a conceptual mistake to ask 
does natural selection favor perceptions tuned to truth or to fitness some argue that the theory of evolution cannot address this question because the answer may refute the theory evolution assumes that there are physical objects in space and time such as dna rna chromosomes ribosomes proteins organisms and resources it could not without refuting itself concluding that natural selection drives true perceptions to extinction for then the very language of space time and physical objects would be the wrong language to describe objective reality our scientific observations of physical objects in space time such as dna rna and proteins would not be very detailed descriptions of the objective reality even if these observations use advanced technologies such as x-ray diffractometers and electron microscopes the theory of evolution would refute itself by discrediting its own key assumptions the logical equivalent of shooting itself in the foot it is true that evolution by natural selection as darwin himself described it assumes the existence of under quotes organic beings but darwin's own summary of his theory hints that the real work is done by an abstract algorithm variation heredity and selection open quotes but if variations useful to any organic being do occur assuredly individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life and from the strong principle of inheritance they will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized this principle of preservation i have called for the sake of brevity natural selection closed quotes this algorithm of variation heredity and selection applies to organic beings but as darwin recognized it also applies more broadly into more abstract entities such as languages open course languages like organic beings can be classed in groups under groups and they can be classed either naturally according to descent or artificially by other characters dominant languages and dialects spread widely and lead to the gradual extinction of other tongues closed course thomas huxley realized that darwin's algorithm applied to the success of scientific theories open course the struggle for existence holds as much in the intellectual as in the physical world A theory is a species of thinking and its right to exist is coextensive with its power of resisting extinction by its rivals closed quotes Richard Dawkins proposed that Darwin's algorithm applies to under quotes memes units of cultural transmission such as under quotes tunes ideas catchphrases clothes fashions ways of making pots or of building arches closed quotes memes can pass from person to person and can be altered in the process open quotes this land is your land closed quotes was first a meme in the mind of Woody Guthrie but it proliferated with variations into the minds of Peter Paul and Mary Bob Dylan and others competing successfully against many songs for the limited time interest attention and memory of human minds many a song that we've never heard was once a meme in someone's mind but had less success at replication Darwin's algorithm has been applied to fields such as economics, psychology and anthropology. The physicist Lee Smolin applied it to the largest scale of all cosmology, proposing that each black hole is a new universe and that a universe more likely to produce black holes is more likely to produce more universes. Our universe has the properties that it does such as the strengths of the weak strong gravitation and electromagnetic forces because they are conducive to creating black holes and through them new universes universes quite different from ours are less likely to produce black holes and thus less likely to reproduce the insight that darwin's algorithm applies not just to the evolution of organic beings but also with some changes to a variety of other domains is called universal darwinism Richard Dawkins coined the term when arguing that Darwin's algorithm governs the evolution of life not just on earth but anywhere in the universe. Universal Darwinism, unlike the modern theory of biological evolution, does not assume the existence of physical objects in space and time. It is an abstract algorithm with no commitment to substrates that implement it. Universal Darwinism can, without risk of refuting itself, address our key question. Does natural selection favor true perceptions? If the answer happens to be no then it hasn't shot itself in the foot the uncanny power of universal darwinism has been likened by the philosopher dan dennett to a universal acid open quotes there is no denying at this point that darwin's idea is a universal solvent capable of cutting right to the heart of everything in sight the question is what does it leave behind i have tried to show that once it passes through everything we are left with stronger sounder versions of our most important ideas 
Some of the traditional details perish and some of these are losses to be regretted, but good redemption to the rest of them. What remains is more than enough to build on. Closed quotes. We can apply Darwin's acid to our belief in true perception. We will find that this belief perishes. Natural selection drives true perception to swift extinction. The very language of our perceptions, space, time and physical objects is simply the wrong language to describe objective reality. Darwin's acid dissolves the claim that the objective reality consists of space, time and objects such as DNA, chromosomes and organisms. What remains is universal Darwinism, which we can employ even after we jettison space, time and objects. How do we apply the acid? In particular, how can we coax Darwin's abstract algorithm to give a concrete answer? Fortunately, the theoretical biologists John Maynard Smith and George Price have found a way in 1973, evolutionary game theory. The basic idea is best understood by example. Camaraderie is not the strong suit of the scorpion Paruroctonus mesiensis. When one scorpion detects vibrations that betray the movement of a rival, it pivots and clutches the intruder with its two claws. The intruder immediately snaps its tail trying to sting the attacker, whereupon each scorpion grabs the tail of the other with one claw and some part of his body with the other. No holds barred wrestling ensues until one scorpion sneaks its sting through a chink in the armor of the other and delivers a lethal injection. It then dines on its conquest, liquefying with its digestive juices and slurping the refreshment. This catch of the day is no rare repast. Cannibalism furnishes 10% of a scorpion's menu, and the females agree is great after sex. In the battle for mates and territories, some animals, including lions, chimps, humans, and scorpions, kill their rivals, but others battle with ritual or restraint. Combatants obey rules of engagement. Some snakes, for instance, shoot their fangs and wrestle. Mule deer fight antler to antler, often intensely, and take no cheap shots elsewhere on the body. Why would belligerents obey rules in such contests? Why this glaring exception to under quotes, nature raid in tooth and claw, closed quotes, and open quotes, all is fair in love and war, closed quotes. We find an answer in a simple game in which players compete for resources using one of two strategies, hawk or dove. A hawk always escalates a conflict. A dove backs down if its opponent escalates. All hawks and doves are equally strong. If the payoff for winning a contest is, say, 20 points, but the cost of injury is, say, 80 points, what will happen? If two hawks compete, neither backs down until one is hurt and the other one wins. Because they have equal strength, each hawk wins half the time and gets 20 points for its win. But each hawk gets hurt half the time and loses 80 points for each injury. So when hawks fight each other, they lose on average 30 points. Their fitness suffers. If two doves compete, each wins half the time and gets 20 points. No dove is hurt, so each dove wins on average 10 points. Their fitness improves. If a hog meets a dove, then the hog wins and no one is hurt. The hog gets 20 points for a win, the dove gets nothing. Fitness improves for the hog, but not for the dove. We can summarize this game in a matrix shown in figure 2 which displays the expected payoff to the strategy on the row when it competes with the strategy on the column. So for instance, the expected payoff for a hawk when it meets a dove is 20, and the expected payoff for a dove when it meets a hawk is 0. Given these payoffs, what strategy is favored by natural selection? The answer depends on the proportion of hawks and doves. Suppose everyone is a hawk, then everyone loses on average 30 points in each competition, a fast track to extinction. Suppose everyone is a dove, then everyone gains on average 10 points in each competition, a fast track to greater fitness. But there is a catch. If everyone is a dove and one hawk shows up, then that hawk has a heyday. It racks up 20 points each time it competes with a dove. This is more than double the points reaped by the doves, who get on average 10 points in contest with other doves and no points in contest with hawks. More fitness points mean more offspring. So this hawk begets more hawks. But the hawk's fun must stop somewhere because, as we saw, if all players are hawks, then each loses 30 points on average, the game implodes in extinction. When does the population of hawks stop growing? When hawks are a quarter of the players. If more than one quarter are hawks, then hawks earn fewer points than doves. If less than one quarter of the players are hawks, then hawks earn more points than doves. 
So in the long run, one quarter of the players end up being Hawks. In this example, a win gets 20 points and an injury loses 80. Change these numbers to 40 and 60. Then the expected payoffs are as shown in figure 3. Now two thirds of the players end up being Hawks. Fitness depends on payoffs and on how many players adopt its strategy. If everyone is a dove, then it's more fit to be a hawk. If everyone is a hawk, then it's more fit to be a dove. The force of natural selection depends on the frequency of each strategy. This is the key point. Fitness is no mirror of the world. Instead, fitness depends in complex ways on the state of the world, and the state of the organism, and the frequencies of strategies. If two strategies compete, the dynamics of evolution can be complex. We saw that hawks and doves can coexist, but there are other possibilities. One strategy might always drive the other to extinction, domination, or each strategy might have some chance to drive the other to extinction, bi-stability, or both strategies might always be equally fit, neutrality. When three strategies compete, the dynamics of evolution always allows cycles, as in the classic children's game of rock, paper, scissors. Scissor beats paper, which beats rock, which beats scissors. When four or more strategies compete, the dynamics of evolution can include chaos, in which a tiny perturbation now makes unpredictable changes down the road. This is also known as the butterfly effect, under quotes. The flap of the wings of a butterfly here, a tiny perturbation, might trigger a tornado somewhere else, an unpredictable consequence. All of this can be studied with the theory of evolutionary games. It is a powerful theory. It has the right tools to study our question, does natural selection favor veridical perceptions? It gives a clear answer, no. This is spelled out in the Fitness Beats Truth FBT theorem, which I conjectured and Chetan Prakash proved. Consider two sensory strategies, each capable of n distinct perceptions in an objective reality having n states. Truth sees the structure of objective reality as best as possible. Fitness sees none of objective reality, but is tuned to the relevant fitness payoffs. Payoffs that depend on objective reality, but also on the organism, its state, and its action. FBT theorem. Fitness drives truth to extinction with probability at least n-3 by n-1. Here's what it means. Consider an eye with 10 photoreceptors, each having two states. The FBT theorem says that the chance that this eye sees reality is at most 2 in a thousand. For 20 photoreceptors, the chance is 2 in a million. For 40 photoreceptors, 1 in 10 billion. For 80, 1 in 100 sextillion. The human eye has 130 million photoreceptors. The chance is effectively zero. Suppose there is an objective reality of some kind. Then the FBT theorem says that natural selection does not shape us to perceive the structure of that reality. It shapes us to perceive fitness points and how to get them. The FBT theorem has been tested and confirmed in many simulations. They reveal that truth often goes extinct even if fitness is far less complex. Amount of stuff on the x-axis and fitness points on the y-axis. Figure 4 shows a fitness function. In this example, small or large amounts of resource are bad for fitness. Intermediate amounts are best for fitness. A specific game shows the problem for truth. Consider an artificial world with creature called creator under quotes, that needs a resource called stuff. Under quotes. If there's too much or too little stuff, then a critter dies. With the right amount of stuff, a critter thrives and reproduces. Stuff attracts a critter as oxygen affects us, too little or too much and we die. The fitness points that stuff can give to a critter are plotted in figure 4. Suppose a critter has just two perceptions, grey and black. A truth critter sees as much as it can about the true structure of the world. It sees grey when there is less stuff and black when there is more stuff. A fitness critter sees as much as it can about the fitness points available. It sees grey when the stuff gives fewer points and black when it gives more. These two strategies, truth and fitness, are shown in figure 5. If truth sees grey, then it knows there's less stuff, but it knows nothing about the available fitness points. If fitness sees grey, then it knows that fewer fitness points are available, but it doesn't know if there is a small or large amount of stuff. Seeing truth hides fitness, and seeing fitness hides truth. Our senses, for instance, doesn't perceive oxygen. Indeed, we didn't discover oxygen until 1772. Instead, our senses report fitness. 
we feel a headache if there is insufficient oxygen and lightheaded if there is too much. Likewise, our senses don't perceive ultraviolet radiation. Indeed, we didn't discover this radiation until 1801. Instead, our senses report fitness. We feel sunburn if we receive too much ultraviolet radiation. If fitness forages for stuff and sees a patch of black, then it knows it is safe to approach. If it sees a patch of gray, then it knows to stay away. But truth has a problem. If truth sees a patch of black, it doesn't know whether it is safe or not. It has the same problem if it sees a patch of gray. So truth, unlike fitness, must risk its life to forage. The truth won't make you free. It will make you extinct. In figure 4, as the amount of stuff increases, the number of fitness points first rises and then falls, a bell curve. If instead the number of fitness points always increased, then perceptions tuned to fitness would also be tuned to truth, simply because the two are correlated. We know the age of a tree by seeing its rings because the two are correlated. More rings means more years. But if they were not correlated, if some years a tree added rings but other years it erased them, then seeing rings would not tell us the age of a tree. If fitness payoffs only increase or only decreased, then perceptions tuned to fitness will also happen to be tuned to truth. So natural selection will happen to favor true perceptions. How likely is this? To answer this question, we count the number of fitness functions that only increase or only decrease. Then we divide by the number of all possible fitness functions. If for instance, there are six values of stuff and six values of fitness payoffs, then only one fitness function in a hundred allows truth to evolve. If there are 12 values, then only two in a hundred million allow truth to evolve. In evolution, like football, you win by scoring more points than the competition. Natural selection favors perceptions that assist us in scoring fitness points. If the number of fitness points happens to correlate with a structure in the world, such as the amount of stuff, then evolution will happen to favor truth. But the chance of this is small for simple perceptions and infinitesimal for those more complex. Stuff has a structure. There can be less or more stuff, but other structures are possible, such as neighborhoods, distances, and symmetries. For each structure, we can ask whether fitness points might, by chance, correlate with that structure. And for each, we get the same answer. The chance plunges to zero as the world and perception grow more complex. In each case, truth goes extinct when competing with fitness. Thinkers of stature have claimed the contrary. Marr held that the fly, due to its simplicity, sees no truth, but that mankind, due to its complexity, sees some. He thought that our larger brains permit, under quotes, the gradual movement toward the difficult task of representing progressively more objective aspects of the visual world, close quotes. This suits our intuition, but conflicts with the logic of evolution, as revealed by the FBT theorem. The notion that our brains are growing in size, and thus in their capacity to see truth, also conflicts with the fact of our evolution. Our brains are shrinking. In the last 20,000 years, our brains have shrunk 10%, from 1,500 cubic centimeters down to 1,350, a loss of the volume of a tennis ball. Our encephalization quotient, or EQ, which compares our ratio of brain mass to body mass with the average ratio for other mammals, has plunged in an eye blink of evolutionary time. According to fossil record, this plunge correlates slightly with climate, but heavily with population density and those we can presume with social complexity. This suggests an interesting explanation. The safety net of society eases selection pressures on members. Some who wouldn't survive alone or in small groups can survive with a larger social net. This possibility, explored with humor in the movie Idiocracy, is speculation for now. But the plunge of our EQ is not. If it continues apace, it will, within 30,000 years, send our brains back half a million years, to the size of Homo erectus. Our brains took the escalator up, and they are on the elevator down. Darwin's idea of natural selection entails the FBT theorem, which in turn entails that the lexicon of our perceptions, including space, time, shape, hue, saturation, brightness, texture, taste, sound, smell, and motion, cannot describe reality as it is when no one looks. It's not simply that this or that perception is wrong. It's that none of our perceptions being caused in this language could possibly be right. The FBT theorem runs counter to strong intuitions of experts and laymen alike. Then it was right. Darwin's idea is a, under quotes, universal acid. It eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview, with most of the old landmarks still recognizable but transformed in fundamental ways. 
closed quotes. That revolutionized view leaves in its wake an evolutionary biology that is itself transformed. It's still recognizable after the bath in Darwin's acid are the landmarks of universe of Darwinism, variation, selection, and heredity. But gone from objective reality are physical objects in space and time, including those central to biology, DNA, RNA, chromosomes, organisms, and resources. This doesn't entail solipsism. Something is there in objective reality, and we humans experience its import for our fitness in terms of DNA, RNA, chromosomes, and resources. But the FBT theorem tells us that whatever that something is, it is almost surely not DNA, RNA, chromosomes, organisms, or resources. It tells us that there is good reason to believe that the things that we perceive, such as DNA and RNA, don't exist independent of our minds. The reason is that the structures of fitness payoff which shape what we perceive differ from the structures of objective reality with high probability. Again, this is no support for solipsism. There is an objective reality, but that reality is utterly unlike our perceptions of objects in space and time. Such a conclusion may seem absurd. Surely, it's due to an error in logic. We just need to spot the error. Perhaps the error lurks in simplifying assumptions of evolutionary games. For instance, such games omit explicit mutations, assume an infinity of players, and stipulate that each player has an equal chance to compete with any other. These simplifications are generally false. Organisms in nature suffer mutations, have finite populations, and interact more with those close by. Evolutionary games ignore these complexities and focus instead on the effects of natural selection. This is precisely the focus we need to test the claim that natural selection favors true perceptions. And the result, the FBT theorem, tells us is clear. It doesn't. An important process omitted by evolutionary games is neutral drift, in which a mutation that has no effect on fitness spreads by chance through a population. It might even drive other alleles to extinction. Such a mutation can mitigate the effects of natural selection so that a difference in fitness that is decisive in evolutionary games is not decisive in a finite population with mutations. If, for instance, fitness has a selective advantage over truth of 100%, then in an evolutionary game with an infinite population, truth always goes extinct when competing with fitness. But in a game with 100 truth players, the chance is only one half that truth goes extinct if a mutation introduces a fitness player. This is a big difference. But it's no boon for the claim that natural selection favors truth. That claim is false, whether populations are finite or infinite, and whether mutations are explicit or not. A finite population can slow natural selection's annihilation of truth, as blasting a breeze may slow an enemy tank, but cannot make it friendly. If we wish to model different likelihoods of interactions between players, then evolutionary games must be played on graphs. This theory is difficult and in its infancy. We know that networks of connections between players can amplify and dilute the pressures of natural selection in complex ways. There is much to be studied in this relatively new field. But so far, there is no support for the claim that natural selection favors truth. The structure of a network may aid or retard the pressures of selection, but these pressures remain hostile to truth. Justin Mark, while a graduate student in my lab, used genetic algorithms with explicit mutations to study the coevolution of perception and action in finite populations. He created an artificial world in which a player could forage for resources and score fitness points. It could walk, look for resources, eat resources, and bump into walls that bounded the world. A suite of genes determined its actions and perceptions. The first generation of players had genes chosen at random so that their actions and perceptions were haphazard, even comically stupid. Some would repeatedly hit a wall or stay in one place or repeatedly try to eat nothing. Each was so witless that by the end of his foraging run, it had scored few points. But some were less daft than others. These were bred, under quotes, and their genes mutated to form a new generation. This process was repeated for hundreds of generations. By the last generation, all players foraged with efficiency and apparent intelligence. The question was, did they evolve to see the truth? The answer was no. Even when perception and action had co-evolved for hundreds of generations, truth did not appear. Players in the last generation saw the fitness of resources, but not their true quantities. Only in the off chance that fitness points track world structures could truth appear. These simulations do not constitute a proof, 
but they suggest that the extinction of truth in evolutionary games cannot be pinned on faulty assumptions. Instead, truth goes extinct because it hunts reality rather than fitness, like a chess player who hunts rooks rather than the king. What other mistake may account for the conclusion that truth goes extinct? Perhaps a notion of veridical perception that is too strong? Consider three notions of veridical perception. The strongest is omniscient realism. Under quotes. We see all of reality as it is. Next is under quotes, naive realism. That is, we see some but not all of reality as it is. The weakest is under quotes, critical realism. The structure of our perceptions preserves some of the structures of reality. If the ability theorem targeted omniscient or naive realism, then we could indeed dismiss its conclusion. No one, save lunatics and solipsists, claims omniscience, and few espouse naive realism. But the theorem targets critical realism, which is the weakest and the most widely accepted notion of veridical observation in the science of perception and in the science more broadly. The FBT theorem does not towards a straw man. Perhaps the theorem has made a mistaken assumption about objective reality. It proves that seeing reality leads to extinction, but what reality? And how could the theorem know or postulate a priori what reality is? A mistake on this point would surely defang the theorem. Indeed it would. For the theorem to be of value, it cannot require a specific model of objective reality, but instead must be true in general. For this reason, the ABD theorem assumes only that reality, whatever it is, has a set of states. States of what? The theorem does not say. It assumes only the states or subsets of states can have possibilities, but it specifies no particular probabilities. The FBD theorem asserts that if reality outside the observer has any structure beyond probability, then natural selection will shape perception to ignore it. The theorem makes no assumptions about the states of reality beyond the claim that we can discuss their probabilities. The claim could be false, but if it is, then a science of reality is impossible, for there would be no way to relate probabilistic outcomes of experiments to probabilistic claims about reality. Perhaps a science of reality is not possible. I hope otherwise, but the FBT theorem, for its part, simply assumes that such a science is possible. Perhaps the FBT theorem is irrelevant to human evolution. Perhaps what is required to understand human evolution is a complete artificial intelligence simulation of humans, together with a simulation of their interactions with all other organisms and with the Earth itself. Perhaps without such a comprehensive simulation, we cannot possibly claim to know that we did not evolve to see reality as it is. Admittedly, our interactions with the environment are complex, indeed so complex that our evolution is chaotic. An infinitesimal nudge to the world now can trigger a tectonic transformation later, but the FBT theorem still applies to human evolution. An analogy can help us see why. Consider the state lottery. Millions of tickets are purchased by thousands of people for hundreds of different reasons, using dozens of different tricks for picking a particular number, birthdays, anniversaries, messages in fortune cookies. Suppose we wish to predict how many people will win at the next drawing. Do we need a complete simulation of all this complexity to get an answer? Not at all. Indeed, it would be a distraction. What is needed instead are a few principles of probability that apply regardless of the myriad details. The same is true of the FBT theorem. It allows us to guess, based on the principles of probability, how many creatures will evolve to see reality as it is. The key insight of the theorem is simple. The probability that fitness payoffs reflect any structure in the world plummets to zero as the complexity of the world and perception source. Chaotic effects prevent precise prediction of the specific perceptual systems that will prevail. But the laws of probability dictate that truth has less chance than your lottery ticket. Does this mean that our perception lie to us? Not really. I wouldn't say that our senses lie any more than the desktop of my computer lies when it portrays an email as a blue rectangular icon. Our senses, like the desktop interface, are simply doing their job, which is not to reveal the truth, but to guide useful actions. The FPT theorem reveals that as the senses grow more complex, they have less chance to disclose any truths about objective reality. Perhaps the FPT theorem only holds for fixed payoffs. If payoffs fluctuate rapidly, then perhaps the best strategy is to see reality as it is. I grant that payoffs, like weather, are mercurial, and for the same reason both arise from complex interactions among a plethora of factors. But protein payoffs afford truth no purchase. Truth, no less than fitness, must track the volatile sequence of fitness payoffs. 
At each step in the sequence, the FBT theorem reveals truth is less fit, a negative amortization that hastens its ruin. Although the flux of payoffs is no help to the truth, it does suggest that fitness will be shaped by natural selection to report differences in payoffs rather than absolute payoffs. We see evidence of this in research on perceptual adaptation. Put on rose-colored glasses and the world looks reddish, but not for long. Soon you see the normal gamut of colors. Stare at a waterfall for a minute, then look at the rocks nearby. They appear to move up while also paradoxically staying put. Enter a movie theater on a sunny afternoon and everything looks black. But soon you see shades of gray. Stare at a happy face for a minute, then look at a face with a neutral expression. It now looks sad. Stare at a blurry image for a few seconds and the world looks sharper. Stare at a sharpened image and the world looks blurry. It was thought that adaptation is simply an anomaly due to overexposure, but experiments by the cognitive scientist Michael Webster reveal that it is an essential feature of all levels of perceptual processing. Change the perceptual environment, put on rose-colored glasses, and your senses quickly adapt to report relative payoffs in the new context. They efficiently encode information about fitness. Or you can fix the environment and change payoffs. Brian Marion, while a graduate student in my lab, had observers play a game in which they earned points for discriminating colors. If they were offered more points for discriminating blues than reds, then within minutes they better discriminated blues. This makes sense if perception reports differences in payoffs. Where there's no difference in payoffs, there's no payoff in seeing differences. Where there are differences in payoffs, then there is payoff in adjusting in real time to see those differences. Not ideally or perfectly, just a bit better than the competition. Adaptation to scenes and rewards are two aspects of one process, tracking fitness payoffs. The reason that adaptation is not a curious anomaly, but instead appears at all levels of perceptual processing, is that tracking fitness payoffs is not a curious anomaly, it is the whole game. But this emphasis on natural selection and adaptation raises a different objection, one is spelled out by the psychologist Rainer Mousefield. On the course, the actual role of natural selection in the evolution of bi complex biological systems is far from obvious. Evolutionary biology has, in more recent years, accumulated pervasive evidence that suggests that the vast majority of evolutionary change has rather little to do with natural selection. Closed course. Most felt worries that the arguments discussed here take natural selection under quotes, as an almost exclusive factor regulating evolutionary change. Closed quotes. Natural selection does indeed act in coordination with many collaborators. There is, as we have discussed, genetic drift. The chance is spreading of a neutral allele, which has no effect on fitness throughout a population. This is more likely in smaller populations. Such drift, some claim, accounts for most of the molecular evolution. It is possible that today's neutral drift might, as niches change, become tomorrow's game changer. Then there is physics. Gravity, for instance, impairs the stability of moving limbs and the circulation of blood, inducing the evolution of bilateral symmetry in most animals and hindering the evolution of necks longer than a giraffe's. Then there is chemistry. Of the 92 elements that occur in nature, only 6 carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium and phosphorus compose 99% of the mass of organisms. There is linkage. Alleles nearby on a chromosome tend to be inherited together during meiosis. There is pleiotropy. One gene can influence disparate aspects of the phenotype, sometimes with opposing effects on fitness. There are no doubt other factors in evolutionary change. And for all I know, Mousefield may be right that the vast majority of evolutionary change has rather little to do with natural selection. But this is no problem for the argument here. The question is not how much evolutionary change is due to natural selection, but rather about the direction of natural selection itself. No one argues, for instance, that we see reality as it is because of the evolutionary process of genetic drift. Genetic drift can do the job, nor can physics, chemistry, linkage, or pleiotropy. When proponents of veridical perception use evolution to argue for their view, they argue that veridical perceptions are fitter perceptions, that seeing reality as it is endows a selective advantage. Whether or not natural selection is the major force in the evolution, it is the force that opponents of veridical perception appeal to, the only one, it would seem, that they can appeal to in support of their claim. What the FBT theorem reveals is that natural selection, 
however major or minor of force it may be, does not shape our perceptions to be veridical. This is bad news for veridical perception in the only place where some had hoped the news might be good. Perhaps the FBT theorem has made a different and quite fundamental blunder. Philosopher Jonathan Cohen puts it as follows. Open quotes. Perceptual states have content, intuitively, what they carry information about, tell us about, or say about the world, and that can be evaluated for truth or falsity. Closed quotes. So, for instance, if I have a perceptual experience that I describe as seeing a red tomato a meter away, then the content of my experience, what it says about my world, might be that in fact there is a red tomato a meter away. Indeed, that is a standard claim in many philosophical accounts about the content of such an experience. But the FVT theorem does not specify what the content of perceptual experiences might be. It simply concludes that experiences, whatever their contents, are not veridical. Cohen argues that this is a blunder because, open quotes, you can't say whether something is veridical or not without first knowing what it is saying, closed quotes. So if I say, open quotes, 1 plus 1 equals 2, close quotes, you can decide if that statement is true because you know what it is saying. But if I say, under quotes, blah plus blah, blah, close quotes, then you can know if the statement is true because it is meaningless, it has no content. If Cohen is right, then the FBT theorem has made a fundamental error at the very start. It does not tell us upfront what the contents of perceptual experiences are, what our experiences say about the world. So the theorem cannot possibly tell us whether our perceptual experiences are veridical. The theorem was a fool's errand from the start. Fortunately for the FBT theorem, there is no problem here. Philosophers have told us why in their study of formal logic. Suppose that I tell you that P is some particular claim and Q is some particular claim, but I refuse to tell you what either claim is. Then suppose I make the further claim, under quotes, P is true or Q is true, close quotes. If I ask you whether this last claim is true, you would have to shrug. If I don't reveal the contents of P and Q, then as Cohen says, you can't answer the question. But suppose is that I instead claim, under quotes, if either P is true or Q is true, then it follows that P is true. Closed quotes. Now I ask you if this claim is true. You don't have to shrug your shoulders. You know that this claim is false, even though you don't know the contents of P or Q. That is the power of logic and of mathematics more generally. It allows us to evaluate the truth or falsity of large classes of statements simply in virtue of their logical or formal structure. Mathematicians prove theorems about functions and other structures on sets without ever answering the question, sets of what? They don't care. It doesn't matter whether it is a set of apples, oranges, quarks, or possible universes, the theorems still apply. No prior content needs to be specified for the elements of the sets. In particular, the rich field of information theory, which underlies the internet and telecommunications, has powerful tools and theorems detailing how messages can be structured and communicated without ever specifying the content of any message. The variety of particular contents is endless, but they all conform to specific rules, allowing us to create a rigorous science, information theory that applies to all messages of any content. This insight underlies the FBT theorem which uses the formal structure of universal Darwinism to tell us universal facts about any evolved perceptual systems regardless of their particular contents. The FBT theorem needs no prior theory of perceptual content, but in a reversal of the logic proposed by Cohen, the theorem actually constrains admissible theories of perceptual content. In particular, according to the FBT theorem, any theory of content that assumes perceptions are in the normal case, veridical is almost surely false, because we evolved to detect and act on fitness not to perceive the true structure of objective reality. This applies to our perception of the middle-sized objects around us. When I have an experience that I describe as a red tomato a meter away, the content of that experience is not that there is in objective reality, even when no one looks, a red tomato a meter away. As it happens then, the FBT theorem rules out all theories of content currently proposed in the philosophy of perception. The FBT theorem extends an insight of the evolutionary theorist Robert Trivers. Under quotes, the conventional view that natural selection favors nervous systems which produce ever more accurate images of the world must be a very naive view of mental evolution. Closed quotes. It is also, according to the FBT theorem, a very naive view of perceptual evolution. 
Steven Pinker sums up the argument well. Open quotes. We are organisms, not angels, and our minds are organs, not pipelines to the truth. Our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and that matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. Close quotes. When the universal acid of Darwin's dangerous idea is poured onto our perceptions, it dissolves the objectivity of physical objects, which we assumed exist and interact even when no one looks. Then this acid dissolves the objectivity of space-time itself, the very framework within which Darwinian evolution has been assumed to take place. This requires us to devise a more fundamental framework without space, time and physical objects for understanding reality. We will need to understand the dynamics of this new framework. When we project this dynamics back into the space-time interface of Homo sapiens, we should get back Darwinian evolution. Darwin's idea forces us to think of Darwinian evolution itself as an imperfect hint couched within the space-time and objects language of our perceptions and as yet unknown dynamics. Darwin's idea is indeed dangerous.